everyone, and welcome back to Confluence. Our next speaker is Korosh Ohangar, and he will be giving his talk titled Entropy-Based Performance Analysis of Connectionist Word Recognition Models. Um, so if you want to take it away, Korosh, go right ahead. Thanks, Nick. Uh, so hi, everyone. Is that share my screen? Yeah, okay. So hi everyone, my name is Kurosh. I've been working for the past couple of months under the supervision of Professor Armstrong uh, in the Computational Cycle and Basic Lab in uh, Scarborough. And I'm here to talk to you about a word recognition model, a computational word recognition model that we've been working with. So uh, when it comes to reading, uh, the thing is that uh, we have a limited scope of visual attention. Uh, so that means that we can't focus on a word and just recognize all of the letters at the same time and just recognize all oh, that this is the word, for example, tragedy that I'm looking at. Uh, therefore, what we are supposed to do is to like focus on a specific letter position. Um, for example, you can focus on a uh, letter position two, which is R here, and you perceive that R and recognize that that is the, the letter R you're looking at, like certainly. But as you start to move away to other letter positions, things start to get uh, fuzzy. So uh, here, for example, if you if you uh, decide to focus on letter position six, the figure on the right shows that um, you, so for tragedy, that will be the letter D. You recognize the letter D completely, like 100% certain, but um, as you start to move further and further away, the probability of a successful perception drops down. Um, and you might not recognize, for example, that the letter that the word begin, begins with is a T. This is a word from a 2019 study by Alhama Fraz, Siegelman, and Armstrong, in which they studied the uh, relation between fixation location and what they call entropy difference. Our research basically built on top of theirs, so I'm gonna be talking more. Uh, about or what they found out. Uh, one of the things that they found out is that um, in different languages, readers tend to fixate. Uh, so fixation basically is that act of fo focusing your visual attention on a specific letter position. Uh, what they found out is that in different languages, professional readers tend to fixate uh, on different letter positions. Uh, for example, in English, uh, most of the readers tend to Fix it towards the middle of the, of the board. Well, in Hebrew, uh, most of the like professional readers tend to fixate somewhere towards the beginning of a board. Um, so the fixation, the preferred fixation location varies across different languages. And the way they tried to explain this kind of phenomena was uh, basically saying that, okay, um, they most probably do that uh, in order to maximize. Uh, mo like maximize the amount of information content that they can extract from uh, fixation. So it would make sense for English readers to fixate towards the middle because they would get the most information by fixating uh, on the middle of the board and Hebrew readers would get the most information by fixating towards the beginning of the board. Uh, so in order to explain this kind of phenomena, they use this concept of entropy difference, uh, but we first have to discuss entropy in order to better understand entropy difference. So what is entropy? Entropy is basically a measure of uncertainty. A high entropy means a high uncertainty about an outcome or an event, um, and a lower entropy means lower uncertainty. Basically, an entropy of zero means you're completely certain about how an event is going to turn out. Uh, for example, take um, imagine a fair coin. Imagine you're flipping a coin and uh, you want to know if you get heads or tails. So if you have a fair coin 50% of the time, uh, you probably get heads and 50% of the other time, like uh, you get tail. Uh, however, if you imagine that you have a biased coin that gives you heads 85% of the time and tails 15% of the time, you can see that the, uh, your uncertainty about the outcome of flipping the coin uh, would not be the same in these two situations. You probably have uh, less uncertainty about the bias coin because you think that, okay, it's more probable that uh, I'm gonna get pets because 85% of the time I get pets. 
So uh, in the case of the bias coin, we have a lower entropy, while in the case of the third one, we have a higher entropy because the outcome uh, is more uncertain. Uh, they use this to come up with this concept uh, of entropy difference. So basically entropy difference tells you where to look, uh, like what letter position to look at in a word in order to extract the most uh, information in order to reduce uncertainty as much as possible. Uh, if a word has a high entropy difference, it means that we should probably fix it towards the end of the word. If a word has a low entropy difference, you should probably fix it uh, towards uh, the beginning of a word. And if a word has an entropy difference of zero, you should fix it towards the middle of the word in order to reduce uncertainty as much as possible. So we see here uh, that <clears throat> for English, for example, uh, the most frequent entropy difference is zero, which would explain why English readers would fix it towards the middle of the board. And for Hebrew, uh, the most frequent uh, entropy difference is around negative two, which again explains why they would uh, fix it towards the beginning of the board. So in order to like reduce uncertainty as much as possible and extract as much information as possible. Uh, so what we did was we basically built a computational model in order to uh, test this kind of hypothesis, the relation between entropy difference and um, word recognition. Uh, so uh, our model had basically three layers, uh, an input layer, a hidden layer um, with a size of 1,000 units, and an output layer. Uh, the input layer basically consisted of um, seven different letter slots, and each letter slot was basically uh, supposed to uh, represent a letter because we were looking at seven letter words. So we had seven letter slots. Each letter slot had uh, was basically a vector of the size of the alphabet. So if we were working with English, that would have been 26. If we were working with Hebrew, that would have been 28. Um, so we fed the, a partial perception of the word. So um, the word, but with some of the letters might have been missing uh, into the network. And that would have been passed on to the hidden layer. And the model was asked, was expected to reconstruct uh, the original board. <clears throat> Why did we go with this kind of architecture? We basically uh, decided to use autoencoders because of their ability to uh, fill in the missing data, because that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to reconstruct a partially perceived uh, word. So autoencoders uh, sounded like a good option for that. An alternative that we had was to use uh, uh, basically a one-hot encoding of not letters but words, uh, for example, for our output letter for our output uh, layer. So if we had, uh, let's say, a lexicon of seven thousand words, uh, we wanted to indicate which word the model is predicting by basically activating one single unit in a vector of size seven thousand. But uh, as you can see, that, that would have um, increased the size of our model like, dramatically. And that would have led to more uh, computational time and training time. So we decided to go with this kind of architecture to keep the uh, size of the model constant and not dependent on the size of the lexicon that we are working with. So this is a, a visualized example of, uh, of how the model was working. Let's say we want to feed in the, the word uh, daytime while fixating at letter position two, that would be A. Uh, so we basically um, <clears throat> applied uh, the drop parameter that uh, I was talking about earlier, and that would have gave uh, that would have given us a sort of partially perceived version of the word with I and E missing, for example. This is a random trial, of course. The, they might have not been like the these letters could have been some other letters like T and N, or all of them might have been uh, present. But anyway, this is a random example. Um, and then that was passed on to the hidden layer. And the, hidden, the result of the hidden layer was then used uh, in order to reconstruct the board. Um, however, we had to analyze the results of the output layer in order to um, understand, like we had to make sense of that in order to understand uh, what exactly is the word that the model is predicting. Let's say that this is the result of the output layer. Of course, we have seven different letter slots, but for each of the letter slots, uh, the, 
unit values would have looked something like this. And uh, we had to do some sort of analysis in order to make sense of these uh, numerical values. Uh, in order to do that, we basically uh, use a bunch of different approaches, basically two broad approaches. So one of them was a zero or one approach. Uh, and these, we basically uh, focused on whether or not we got the word right. So either we succeeded or we failed, there was no middle ground. Uh, on the other hand, we also used cross entropy error in order to measure how uh, how how much of a mistake we're making or how close are we to the target that we were supposed to be getting. So for crude accuracy, um, by the way, so the zero error approaches include crude accuracy, normalized accuracy, best lexical fit, which I'm going to discuss briefly, and the other one is just cross activity error. So for crude accuracy, uh, we basically took the output of the the, the all the unit uh, units in the output layer, and we basically rounded them. So every every unit above uh, zero point five was set to one, and uh, every unit with a value below that was set to zero. So um, if the target was, uh, for example, C, let's say this is a letter slot. Uh, of course, I couldn't fit twenty six uh, units here, so I decided to go with three. Let's say this is a letter slot, and the first uh, unit represents A, second unit represents B, and the third, uh, third unit represents C. If we were supposed, if our target was the letter C, um, and we got this kind of output from uh, from the model, if we rounded it, we got something like this. We got, uh, so two of the units in our final result was activated. Uh, however, this, we couldn't really do much work with because, um, it like we have to make sense of that somehow and we can't say that the model is predicting uh, two letters at the same time for a specific letter slot so we can't say that that model is predicting this letter slot to be b and c at the same time so uh, we try to be a little smarter and uh, we use normalized accuracy basically we only set the highest um, activated unit in the output uh, in the result of the model to one and the rest to zero so this at least uh, gave us a unique letter for each letter slot. So uh, the model was predicting a specific board. This it might not have been a correct word, it might not have been a word that was that existed in lexicon, but at least it was uh, uh, a word. Uh, so each letter slot had a unique corresponding letter. Um, however, when we use best lexical fit, the last problem that I mentioned is also the result. So uh, in best lexical fit, what we do is basically we get a vector representation of all the words in the lexicon. Uh, we transfer them all uh, to vectors to something uh, similar to what the out what the what our model produced. And then we compare the output of the model to uh, each of these vectors. And we uh, using a cosine similarity score, which is a similarity score that you can use to see how similar two vectors are. We pick the <clears throat> closest vector from the lexicon, and that represented basically the prediction of the model. So uh, in the end, uh, what we got from the model was uh, an existing word in the lexicon. Uh, and this kind of made it somewhat error tolerant so if the if the word that the like if, if with normalized accuracy the word that we were getting was this a mistyped uh a misspelled school uh with best lexical fit uh, that problem was automatically uh resolved because uh, it would have been transferred to school automatically because that was the closest word in the lexicon that uh for example the output of the model in addition we uh, use cross entropy error uh, basically compared the output of our model to the targets to uh, measure how close we are to the target and how good uh, we are predicting them. Uh, this provides a quantization of correctness instead of just saying this is we get we got the target right or wrong. Uh, since we didn't expect the model to predict exact zeros or exact ones as we would have it in the targets, uh, we use target radius and zero error radius to basically be kind of fairness to, to the output of the model. Uh, so if we expected the model to produce a zero uh, for an output unit, basically what this did is 
if the model produced something between 0 0.9 and 1, we would not have penalized the model. We kind of accepted it as an acceptable kind of output. Uh, in terms of the corpora that we used, we used two different corpora. One of them was uh, gathered from Open Subtitles. It's a website that includes subtitles of the movies. Uh, for this corpus, um, we had eight, around 8,000 words for English and uh, 5,500 for Hebrew. And uh, we also used another corpus uh, gathered from the Wikipedia web pages. And this one included around 9,000 words for English and 18,000 words for Hebrew. For each of these purposes, we had to uh, calculate the entropy difference values. And uh, in order to do that, uh, for each word, um, we applied the drop factor and we applied the partial perception process that I mentioned earlier uh, a whole number of times uh, in order to calculate the entropy difference distribution. And what you see here is that as the number of child um, increases, the entropy difference distribution that we get is more stable and is more accurate. Uh, and the random factor that is affecting the result of, for example, this one, uh, does not affect uh, the entropy difference, uh, entropy difference distribution uh, on this one when we have uh, 2,500 trials for each word. Uh, so uh, having calculated all those entropy difference values and distributions, uh, we trained the model and the result that we got basically confirmed the hypothesis and the claim of the previous paper that I mentioned. Um, so that means that the model was able to predict the words more accurate, accurately uh, when the words, if the words had a low frequency, a low uh, entropy difference distribution, the model was able to predict more successfully than fixating uh, towards the beginning of the word. And if they had a high entropy difference value, uh, the model was able to predict more successfully than fixing towards the end of the word. Uh, here we see an equivalent graph. This one is just depicting cross entropy error, meaning that the model uh, was able to achieve uh, less error when fixating towards uh, when fixating on a letter position that corresponded to the entropy difference value uh, of the word. <coughs> uh, a very interesting point was that uh, the, the result that we got from the model also reflected the, the result that we got from a behavioral test. So in the behavioral test, uh, we had participants come uh, basically focus uh, on a single um, dot, for example, in the middle of the screen. So we had that their visual focus at a specific point. And then we presented a word for a split second to them. And then the participant were asked to basically type in the word that they saw uh, was shown to them. Uh, we enforced the fixation location by shifting the word uh, right or left such that their visual focus would have been at the letter position that the fixation location was supposed to be at. So this is the result that we got from uh, the behavioral test. Uh, this is basically, again, saying that this is basically comparing uh, fixation location two and six uh, for words with, uh, for two set of words with high uh, entropy difference value and low entropy difference value. And it kind of reflects the result that we get from our model. Uh, basically, both uh, point to the fact that <clears throat> it is easier to, like, it is easier to predict. Uh, to recognize a word when fixating towards the beginning of a word if it has a low entropy difference value uh, and vice versa. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we examined the role of entropy and uh, preferred fixation location using a computational model. And the result that we got from the computational model uh, basically uh, reflected the result that we got from the behavioral test. And it confirmed the hypothesis I mentioned above and the claim of the uh, 2019 paper I was talking about. From the approaches that we used, this lexical fit seemed more promising, more promising and uh, more appropriate than the rest of them. But it was also computationally uh, heavier than the rest of them. Um, <clears throat> the result that we got was consistent uh, across the different uh, corpora that we used. So basically, open subtitles. 
and Wikipedia basically both both of them gave the same results. However, uh, the accuracy, like the accuracy of entropy difference value, uh, was very important in our analysis because we needed to get uh, accurate entropy difference values for the analysis to be uh, valid. Uh, some future work in this in this area that we are currently working on is to look if uh, our models, our computational models, uh, tend to make the same kind of mistakes as uh, the ones that we see in uh, behavioral tests, as the ones that the humans make. Uh, that brings me to the end of my talk, and thank you all for listening. Great. So uh, we're going to open up some questions for you now, Karosh. Um, the first one I have for you is from Jeremy. He says, you seem to be reconstructing some form of pictorial representation. However, in languages, we would either have phonetic or visual cues aiding our reconstruction. How do you think your architecture can incorporate those cues? Um, so we basically, um, okay. So we like in the, in the, so in terms of the visual cues, the visual focus that I was talking about and uh, uh, basically the draw parameter that we were trying to apply was trying to uh, simulate the same kind of uh, patterns so that when you focus on uh, a specific letter position, uh, the probability of recognizing that letter uh, is maximized while uh, the rest of the letters are not um, as certain to perceive basically. But um, in terms of like uh, another kind of cues, basically we try to focus uh, mainly on our, our work basically assumed that um, we can recognize the work that we were looking at and with some probably the rest of the letters. Um, so the focus of our research was not uh, like it was not as comprehensive as you might as one might wish, but uh, yeah, we tried to focus on the same. Um, so our next question kind of has two parts. Uh, first, what drew you towards this line of research? And uh, second, how do you plan to test your future work and uh, your hypothesis? Um, so I. Uh, Languages, of course, are like very interesting to me because I'm coming from a, a bilingual background. So differences in uh, different patterns uh, that uh, readers and like different languages demonstrate was always interesting to me. And uh, yeah, that that was that was why I was drawn into this type of research that uh, looked at different languages and how different readers of different languages. Uh, basically behave. Uh, in order to how to test the uh, future, like the hypothesis that I mentioned at the end, we, so I think we kind of can see, like we have, we can gather data about the behavior of this, how, what kind of mistakes the humans make, because um, they're asked to type in a word. So, um, the kind of mistakes that humans make is kind of easy. We, we, we can gather them easily. Uh, if they mistake like a, like, um, I don't have an example for this, but a specific input board for a, another word in the lexicon, we can gather that. So how we can compare that to the result of the model is a bit more tricky. Uh, but I think we, for each of the methods that I described, except for crude, crude accuracy, uh, we have a specific word predicted by the model. Um, so we just have to find a way consistent enough to say that, okay, in this regards, uh, the predictions of our model match or do not match uh, the predictions of humans and the behavioral tests. I haven't thought it through completely, but uh, it seems uh, doable. Great. Uh, so we have a next Another question from Iris. What are the broader implications of your work? How is it relevant to psycholinguistics, psychology, or perhaps even above and beyond those fields? Um, so basically, it just confirmed uh, the, uh, 
claim of the 2019 paper that uh, the fixation, the preferred fixation location um, can be explained by using information theory. So by using concepts like um, entropy um, and the amount of information extraction. Uh, so that could, like this type of work could lead to uh, more use of information theory based approaches in psycholinguistics. Um, so yeah, okay. that basically. Nabila asks, you mentioned different diff differences in other languages like Hebrew. If you had bilingual participants who are proficient in a language where they read right to left, as well as English, where do you think, where they, sorry, if you had bilingual participants who are proficient in a language where they read right to left as well as English, where they read left to right, do you think you would see a difference in what area of the word they focus on? That is a very interesting question. And um, I'm, I'm honestly not quite sure. Uh, I think it would make sense that they would not fixate on the same fixate on the same letter positions as uh, like a native um, let's say let, let let's say that uh, as a like okay here's what I'm getting at um, people who speak for example English as a second language I think it might be probable that they would not fixate uh, on the exact same letter positions as uh, like native speakers of or native leaders of English um, but there shouldn't be much of a difference, I think. I'm not, I'm honestly not quite sure. But uh, if, again, they they want to extract as much, much information as possible, uh, there shouldn't be much of a difference. Um, however, um, I can imagine that uh, the patterns do not match exactly, but I don't think if, for example, if you are uh, a native reader of, uh, let's say, Arabic, which uh, reads from left to right or right to left, uh, there should be a dramatic difference between, I think, uh, between the fixation locations you uh, use in Arabic versus English, even as a second language. Yeah, it would be interesting to see how similar they would be. Um, and we just have one last question. It's a clarification question from Sophia. Did you only look at one letter at a time? And do you think that looking at clusters as well would be relevant to your research? Uh, we did only look at, so, so we did uh, look at one fixation location at a time and only one fixation location per trial. Um, yeah, I think that would be interesting to see uh, what, for example, combinations of uh, letter positions would give the best results. Um, but that would uh, a little some modification to the uh, to the way that we're doing like to the way that we're constructing the model and to the way that uh, we're carrying out the analysis. Uh, but yeah, definitely, I think that that will be very interesting to see too. Great. So that's all for questions. Uh, if everyone could give Korish here a virtual round of applause, um, we'll you. be back in about. 10 minutes with our next speaker. Uh, that'll be at 2.45. Thanks, Gorish. Okay.